We're very honored to have with us this evening uh, Senator Barbara Boxer uh, here in D.C., of course. Uh, Congress is considered uh, somewhat of a local institution, uh, and we tend to be more familiar with a number of the members uh, than many other Americans are. Uh, but even so, Senator Boxer uh, has been among the standouts. Uh, part of that reflects her uh, longevity in Congress. Uh, she's served in the Senate nearly two dozen years and was in the House of Representatives for 10 years before that, uh, representing a, a sizable part of the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, all in all, her career in politics spans four decades, uh, back to when she won election to the Marin County Board of Supervisors. Uh, but more than the many years that she has dedicated to elected office, it's how hard uh, Senator Boxer has fought for a number of progressive causes that has distinguished her. Widely recognized as one of Congress's most tenacious liberal advocates, uh, she's been a leader in women's rights, LGBT rights, uh, and environmental protection. Uh, for a time, she was the Senate Democrat's chief deputy whip and later chaired the Senate Committee on uh, the Environment and Public, uh, Public Works, uh, as well as the Ethics Committee. Uh, last year, she announced uh, she wouldn't be running again after her current term expires this year. Uh, in her new book, The Art of Tough, she looks back over her years in office. Uh, the book is a, 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 a spirited um, valedictory address, uh, recalling key struggles, offering lessons in getting things done, and promising to continue to work on such critical legacy issues as climate change, race, and medical care. Uh, I'm sure we're in for some very interesting stories this evening uh, and useful lessons in how to be tough. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Senator Barbara Boxer. I'll be right there. There's a little box I have to stand on. So I have to... Now you can see me. And I can see you, which is important. Well, I am so happy to be here, and I'm so grateful to you for coming tonight uh, so that we can talk together, reason together. <laughs> and um, the way they told me it will be done is that I will speak for about a half hour which for a senator is like one minute. So I, somebody will tell me if I go over, seriously. They say, oh, there it is. What does that mean, seven to, oh, that's how much time has passed. D does your seven minutes count on mine or? <laughs> anyway, anyway, someone will say it's time and then we'll go to your questions. And what I wanted to make sure you know is that, of course you don't have to just ask about the book. There may be a few other things on your mind which you might want to ask me about. So it's open season, anything. I am exceedingly proud that um, part of my family is here tonight, and I would love if they would stand up. My daughter, Nicole, who many of you may know, her husband, Kevin, and my grandson, Sawyer. <laughs> Sawyer is getting used to being in the public world. He's ready to grab the mic. Um, I also want to tell you uh, that uh, a very special person came with me from California, Kimberly Cameron, who is my agent, my book agent. And I want her to stand, and, and I want you to applaud her, because I'll tell you why in a minute. Stand up, Kimberly. And she's here with David, our friend, so, and my husband sends his best, but he is taking a bit of a break from all of this. We've been running around New York and everything else. Okay. So, um, The Art of Tough. What is the purpose of the book? And it does have a couple of purposes. One is to just take my readers behind the scenes into the inside of the inside of the inside. You know, of how a bill really becomes a law or does not become a law. And how does the various, how do the various personalities matter? And why is it so important that we have diversity, that 
People in the room just make the difference as to what comes out of the room. If you go in a room and everyone looks alike and they've had the same experiences, what comes out of that is not relevant to the country. And as you know, for a lot of our history, and even now, it's, uh, the legislature here is not diverse enough. The House, a lot more than the United States Senate. So the first thing is to really take you into those rooms and share with you some of the amazing stories that have happened to me where I've been in those rooms or purposely shut out of those rooms. And then the second piece came about not on purpose, but it happened, which was to explain to my readers how you have to have the thickest skin in the world to do the work that I do, and frankly, not only the work that I do, but even maybe for all of you. And so what has come out of this is more than I thought, because after I wrote down all the stories I wanted to share, um, I realized that I had to explain, how did I get to be tough? People would keep coming up to me through the years. How can you stand it? How do you take it? They say this about you, they say that. They run these horrible commercials. How do you stand it? And at first I would answer, you know, I'm just an ordinary person. I, I went to public school. I grew up in Brooklyn. That's part of the answer, probably. And uh, yes, a lot of her. Brooklyn is so cool now. But when I grew up in Brooklyn, it was so not cool. Um, but I learned these lessons. And then the other thing that happened, and I say this to share it with you, because I think you need to think about it too. The person who I thought would come out as the one who really gave me all these lessons, I thought that would be my father, because he was my amazing role model and a miraculous human being who was the youngest of nine kids, the only one born in America, who got his education going to school at night, going to law school at night, and basically always told me, just follow your dreams. And I thought, when I sat down to recognize what are the rules of the art of tough, and I'll share some of them with you. Mostly, the lessons came from my mother. I, I was surprised. My mother, who never graduated from high school, because when she was 16, her parents got sick, and she had to work. So here I am, a United States senator, you know, the daughter, my mother was an immigrant. I really have a lot to say to Donald Trump, but I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna depart. I'm not gonna depart. I don't know what you're saying. She said I should save it. Yes, I will. That's my daughter. She tells me everything, and she's 99% right. Um, but this is what I wanted to share about Kimberly. Once I got the book together, and it really became a memoir. Um, I was searching for a name, and I knew I wanted tough in the title. So I came up with these names, like why I had to be tough, um, why you have to be tough, why do people have to be tough? I was looking, searching, um, you got to be tough. You know, I never could hit it. And uh, Kimberly uh, says, in the middle of the night, she came up with the art of tough, and she called me, and I said, that's it. It was just the right title. And the reason is, and I'll, t I'll share with you by reading, um, just going around being you know, a bully isn't what being, you know, engaging in the art of tough. So I'm going to read you a couple of things, because what I do in this book is what I learned when I, every time I ran for office, and I ran... I think I've run 12 times. Lost the first time, won 11 straight. And one of the things that the, thank you, yeah. <laughs> thank you, California. Um, one of the things you're taught is, don't, if you have a problem, you know, people think you're this, that, or the other, deal with it up front. Take your biggest negative. Talk about it. Turn it into a positive. So when I wrote this book, I thought, people are going to go, who does she think she is? She's so tough, you know. So I wrote this, and I'll explain it in the very first chapter. And by the way, the preface is written 
by Kirsten Julebrand, who I love. I'm so proud of her, and she's going to pick up so, much of, so many of my issues. So here's how the book starts, chapter one. I'm no martial artist or big-time, high-stakes moneymaker. I barely measure five feet, maybe five feet three, in my high heels. And nobody has ever accused me of having a menacing presence. No, but I've lived with an emotional intensity, a sense of indignation, determination, and sometimes outrage that has often inspired opposing reactions among my political colleagues, voters, and right-wing pundits who have said these and other quotable things about me. Are you ready to hear these things? Here's one. Barbara Boxer is a great candidate for the Democratic Party, female and learning disabled. That's Ann Coulter. Thank you. How's this one? Barbara Boxer is quite possibly the biggest doofus ever to emerge from the Senate chambers, including janitorial staff, pizza delivery kids, and carpenter ants. That was someone I don't know. Um, but these names are in, we do. And I guess, since we are in this very holy place, I shudder to read this to you, but I'm going to. Because this one is so over the top, is unbelievable. So this is one. This is um, Michael Savage. It's a perfect name for him. He has a radio show in San Francisco. This is what he says. In the future, Barbara Boxer may be remembered as the Frau Dr. Mengele of the US Senate. And then in case you don't know what it means, he explains it. Dr. Joseph Mengele, the Nazi war criminal who directed merciless human experiments may have decided to come back as a woman. Yeah. So the art of tough, how to take that garbage and how to use it as a badge of honor, how to make it become the wind at your back, and that is what it takes. And then I realized there were lots of other things that I knew about how to handle things. Um, I want to talk to you about one, there's a funny one about, which I'll just touch on. One of the rules of the art of tough is never act out of anger, because if you do, you're going to mess it up. And so I learned this the hard way. I had a kid in school who was chasing me around and all that. How many of you remember being chased by boys when you were a little kid? The girls, I'm talking. <laughs> A couple of guys raised their hands. It's very possible girls or boys were chasing you. The bottom line is this one kid was in my face. Now, I grew up in Brooklyn, and I, the only people I knew were Irish, Jewish, and Italian. And the reason I mention that, you'll see why. And as a matter of fact, I don't think I ever met a wasp until I got to Congress, and I met Pete Stark. And I went up to him, and I said with a smile on my face, Pete, I'm so happy to meet you. You're the first wasp I ever knew. And he said, don't get excited. I'm a Unitarian. So, then, so I'm still looking if there's anybody out there. Um, so anyway, one day, Albert just got in my face just too much. And I didn't want to take it to the principal because I thought it was babyish. I took matters into my own hands. I took my number two lead pencil, and I stabbed him in the arm right where you get a vaccination. I mean, just dead on. And I was, no, that was not a good thing to do. I was 10 years old. I was about 10. Well, both of us started to cry. There was nobody else around. Both of us cried. I, because I knew I'd lost it, and he, because he knew he deserved it. And, um, and so uh, it was our secret. And I just went on my way. Well, the next day, Albert was absent from school. I didn't think much of it. The second day, Albert was absent. So I suffered the anguish and the anxiety of knowing that I had done the wrong thing, you know? So the third day, I'm walking home, and I lit. <laughs> the way I walked home, I walked down empty lots, and it was really kind of the crown hat section of Brooklyn, and it wasn't beautiful. And I see his house. 
and there's a, and he's Italian Catholic, there's a big black crepe piece of cloth over his house. Now I knew I killed him. So I go, I finally find my mother, and I say, Mom, I have to talk to you. She says, what is it, Barbara Sue? Which is what she said when she knew there was trouble. And I give her the story. She says, you would never, you knew Daddy and I told you, you never hurt them. You don't, and she went at it, and she said, but I don't think you killed him. I said, Mommy, please find out. I, I'm such a wreck. So she calls up the principal. He says, no, Albert's fine. His grandfather died. So, I mean, it's not like I was happy that his grandfather died, but I was so relieved it was his grandfather and not him that I hugged Albert when I saw him. That was hard to do, but, but he left me alone after that. That's one thing I will tell you. <laughs> he left me alone. So one of the rules of the art of tough, and there are nine, but I'm not going to tell you all because you've got to read the book to find out all the answers. Don't act out of anger. Another rule of the art of tough is fight against racism. You cannot consider yourself at all tough or really part of the human race if you don't speak out when you see these things happening. And um, now I have to find the part so I could read it to you just a second. Talk among yourselves. <laughs> yeah, I found it. Well, my mother, who I adored, I adored both my mother and my father, got sick and had to go to Miami. And again, I was at age that 1950, about 10. And um, I didn't want to be left alone. And so they decided they'd take me out of school for a week or 10 days while she got better lying in the sun, which is what you did then. You know, the sun, they didn't think about any problems with the sun. So she goes down there and I go with her. And um, I'm going to share this story. Despite all the amenities around me, I was grumpy. So after the sun and rest seemed to work and mom started to feel better, she said, let's go to the movies. I jumped at the chance and grabbed her hand as we headed for the bus. Leaving the hotel grounds and gliding down Collins Avenue where the bright light bounced off spanking new hotels, I felt free and happy. We stepped onto a bus and the unexpected happened something that would stay with me for the rest of my life. I get a little emotional when I read this, so forgive me if I get emotional. It was very crowded, but we were able to find seats side by side. The bus went to the next stop. An elderly black woman got on and I jumped up to give her my seat, as I had been taught to do since forever. No, but thank you, the woman said. I tried to insist, but she walked past us to the back. I was hurt. I didn't understand why she refused the courtesy. I looked at my mother, who had bent toward me and whispered, this is the South, honey. She has to go to the back of the bus because of the color of her skin. What? Why? I said. That's the way it is here, segregated. So there was my mom far from Brooklyn, away from my dad, whose college and law degrees she helped make possible with her support, her love, and her sacrifice. There she was, alone with me, and face to face with racial prejudice. She could have ignored it, said it was none of our business, let it go, and allowed the moment to pass. But mom saw this moment as a key one for me, and I've loved her for that ever since. Follow me, she said, grabbing my hand. She led me to the back of the bus. Since there were no seats left, we stood next to a pole near the rear exit. My mom held on to the pole. I held on to my mom. I felt like the other passengers were staring at us. Let me get this. Maybe even glaring. At that point, I knew we were somehow behaving differently, and we were doing it on purpose. Mom explained what was happening by whispering in my ear, and I felt grown up, part of her team. But I was a little unsettled. I just barely, I, this is ridiculous, I can't get through this. I, 
I've read it so many times, I'm gonna try. Then mom did what she often did when I needed comforting. She rubbed my back with her strong fingers up and down my spine, across my shoulders, as the bus rolled slowly down the boulevard. My mom never knew that one day, as a United States Senator, her daughter would meet Rosa Parks, the woman who changed the bus craziness and sit in the Capitol rotunda as a statue of Ms. Parks was dedicated. She didn't know I would also co-sponsor a law to honor Jackie Robinson with a Congressional Gold Medal in 2003. She didn't know, she didn't know the single gesture on the bus would mold me, or did she? That's that hard. So, in the book, there's serious stuff and there's humorous stuff. Um, how much time do I have left so I can decide? No, no, tell me. Tell me, seriously. Okay, all right, that's good. Um, I'll tell you something funny now just to get the mood entirely, <laughs> change the mood. Um, one of the other rules of the art of tough is to have a sense of humor and to, in any way that you can. You know, for me, it was writing funny lyrics, limericks uh, to songs, or just limericks, just words that rhyme. And um, I learned to do it really a long time ago, but then when I got to Congress, I faced a situation where I was so mad at something, and I learned the lesson, don't act of anger, See if you can use your sense of humor and win the day. So when I got to the House, there were very few women in 1982, like 23, I want to say, maybe as many as 28, something like that. But those of us who were there, we were pretty strong. Pat Schroeder, myself, Geraldine Ferraro, Olympia Snow, it was a group of us, pretty good group. Um, Barbara Mikulski, the great Barbara Mikulski. And so, of course, coming from California, I had the workout sensibility. And we, in those years, women were using a gym. Hello. So I get to the house and they say, oh, you can't use the regular gym, but there's a woman's gym. I said, okay, that's terrific. So I go take a look at the women's gym, and I am not exaggerating. It's half the size of this stage. It has not one piece of equipment in it, but it has five hair dryers, the kind with the big hoods that go, because why else would a woman want to use the gym other than to wash her hair and put it in rollers and sit under it and get sweaty? So I thought this cannot be possible, but I thought I'd make the best of it. So I have a friend, her name is Claudette. Tell the story in the book. And I say, Claudette, Will you lead us in aerobics? There's about six of the women who want to do it. So she comes, we, she's from California, she comes out. We get in the room, she's terrific. First of all, Geraldine dressed, she looked like she could be on the cover of Vogue. Olympia Snow even had her pearls on, but the rest of us, we were down and ready to go. So Claudette says the first thing, put your arms out to the side. And we're all five of us or six of, we're touching each other's hand. So she says, well, some of you go in the back. Okay. Now she says, are you ready? Yes, ready. She says, okay, everybody. And she's got music in the back. And she says, raise your hands up to the ceiling. And everybody raises. Now put them again out to the side, out to the sway. Then she says, take your hands and put them on your hips. At which point Mikulski said, if I could find my hips, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> Swear to God, how do you forget it? So we cracked up just like you are, and we ended the entire session. And we thought, what are we going to do? But I wasn't one to give up. So I went to Eddie Bolin. He was the head of the House Administration Committee, no dice. Then they said, if you can convince Danny Rostenkowski, because he's got, he for some reason has reserved for himself two big empty rooms right near the women's gym. And if we can get those rooms, we can expand the gym. 
So he was my really good friend, so I said, Danny, we have to have a talk. Oh, I heard you were going to talk to me at the gym. Yeah, I am. Can we have those two rooms? No. Why? He says, I need them. I said, well, what's in there? He said, I store <laughs> gifts, <laughs> gifts from Helene Curtis, which is a manufacturer, or was, I don't know if they still are, of shampoo and conditioner and beauty products, which I keep in those two rooms, so when Christmas comes, I give all the help and everybody gifts. I said, well, put them somewhere else. <laughs> Absolutely not. You're not getting that real estate. You know, that's it. Now I didn't know what to do. So instead of getting crazy angry, so I thought, I'm going to write a song about it and see if I can get a couple of the congresswomen to sing it with me. We'll try it out with a couple of guys, and if they like it, we'll sing it to Tip O'Neill. <laughs> so we get a guitarist. By the way, the picture, well, there's a picture in the book, in, in, you'll see it, of us singing to Tip, but anyway, here's how I'm going to sing it, so don't freak out when you hear this, okay. It, I'm not going to sing the whole thing, sing a little bit of it. Sawyer, Grandma, I hope I don't embarrass you too much. Okay. It went like this. Exercise, glamorize, where to go will you advise? Can't everybody use your gym? And it goes on. Equal rights, let's wear tights, let's avoid those macho fights. Can't everybody use your gym? Now if you run into a colleague who looks sad and blue, she'll fight and fuss, might even cuss, you bet your life it could be us. Cause we're not slim, we're not trim. Can't we make it hers and him? Can't everybody use your gym? We're only asking, very big finish. Can't everybody use your gym? So we get in the gym. We get into the gym. They were so embarrassed. They could not handle it. So Art of Tough. Use a sense of humor. Don't give up. Don't go to the anger mode. It doesn't really work. So the last thing I'm going to talk to you about is a serious thing. So we keep going back and forth from, but isn't that what life is, right? Sometimes you laugh, sometimes you cry, sometimes you do nothing, it's boring, but most of us it's not that boring. Um, I want to tell you about Anita Hill. I think you know that a lot of us have said, without Anita Hill, uh, we would never have had the Year of the Woman in 1992. Now, before we get to focus on the Year of the Woman, we only went from two to six women, but we tripled our numbers, so it became the Year of the Woman. I always thought it was overstated. We now have 20. But this is what I want to say. The courage of Anita Hill is not appreciated in my view, in this nation, although they just did a really good HBO. How many of you saw the HBO movie? If you haven't seen it, see if you can watch it. It's pretty accurate. It's not 100% accurate, but it's pretty accurate. But I want to tell you what happened. The Senate had just uh, said no to Robert Bork for the Supreme Court, and they were under pressure to uh, have this hearing on Clarence Thomas, and they did. And um, I would say they were under pressure to confirm. So they had very quick hearings, and then they said, we're ready to vote. And with that comes Anita Hill. She'd been asked by the staff, some of the staffers, if she had any bad experiences with him, and she laid it out pretty chapter and verse. So. We called up George Mitchell and Joe Biden and said, are you going to open up the hearings? No. We said, when I say we, the women members of the House. And we couldn't get anywhere. So Pat Schroeder came up with this idea. Let's march over to the Senate. Let's march up the stairs. Some of us will do some speeches on the House floor. The rest of us will march up the stairs. We will demand that the hearings be open and we'll tell the press to, that we're doing it. So we do it. Now, if you, that's another picture that's in the book. 
it cost a lot of money to get the rights to that picture that we had to, we had to pay carefully. But there it is, the women walking up the steps. And what you can see in our, for those of you who have the book, what you can see in our walk is this incredible energy, determination, focus, anger, call it what you will. It's all in our body language. And as you look at the picture, you'll see that I'm the first one running up, but it's not really fair to Pat, because it was her idea, but I was in better shape, because I was from California, and the rest of them were going, and I was up the steps. We get up the steps, we knock on the door. And, a, and we know, because now I'm in the Senate, I could tell you what was going on is there was just the lunch of the senators, the Democratic senators. So knock on the door, a woman comes out. She's Mitchell's assistant. She says, uh, what is it? And we say, we're seven women from the House. We must come in. We must talk to the uh, senators. We must tell them they have to open up the hearings. These are serious. Anita Hill is serious. She deserves respect and dignity, and she has to be listened to. So her response to us is, sorry, we don't allow strangers in the Senate. <laughs> Which, by the way, I wrote a, a little book with that title about it. But don't allow strangers. We said, what are you talking about strangers? We have 100 years of experience, and we're from all over the country. So she says, well, don't take it personally. It's a term of art. It means people who aren't uh, senators are called strangers, which I really think she made that up because I'm in the Senate. I have never heard that. <laughs> so I think good thinking on her part, but it didn't work. So finally, I reached for the art of tough. What was I going to do? Bash the door in, take out my number two lead pencil? I knew that didn't work. <laughs> so I said, I said, I want you to come out here for a minute. She did. I said, look down the steps. What do you see? She says, 37 cameras. I said, yeah, and you know what we're going to do? We're going to walk right down, and we're going to stand in front of those 37 cameras, and we're going to tell, you, tell them that you wouldn't let us in. She says, wait a minute. And she, she talk, so we said, we'll, we'll settle to just talk to George Mitchell. She opens the door. We meet with George. George opens up the hearing. But what I write in the book and what happened is a perfunctory, a perfunctory opening up of the hearings. And I blame myself. I blame myself for Clarence Thomas, isn't that? That's hard to sleep at night, but I want to read that to you, why I said that about myself. I blame myself because I thought when we marched up the steps, that was it. That once we marched up the steps and Anita was heard, that was it. Complete, I mean, she was the most credible, law professor, fabulous, articulate, smart, the best of the best. So I took my eye off it, so let me tell you what I wrote. I blame myself for not focusing more on what was happening behind the scenes after we marched up the steps of the Senate. I might have learned in real time what I learned later, that the committee had refused to allow the testimony of other women who were prepared to say that Thomas had made unsolicited sexual advances. And then I go, I mention who these women are. One of them said to the FBI, if you were black, young, female, reasonably attractive, and worked directly for Clarence Thomas, you knew full well you were being inspected and auditioned as a female. Then there was an article in 93, way later in the New Yorker, by Jane Mayer and Jill Abramson, stating that Joe Biden had abdicated control of the Thomas confirmation hearings and didn't call four women, four women, who had traveled all the way to Washington to corroborate her claims. And they also said that they were ready to say that he had lied under oath about his interest in pornography and uh, other things. So here's what I say. Looking back, I failed to do the follow through. I failed big time. Not that it would have been easy. We women of the house were seen as the enemy. We really were. Enemies of the status quo, of the way things were, of the gentlemanly way things were. I believe that even my buddy Joe Biden had to succumb to the vast majority of his committee members on both sides. And then I tell this other story. It's a long, sad story. And even more, in 2010, 
Clarence Thomas's wife, Virginia, left a voicemail message on Anita Hill's office phone at Brandeis. She said, quote, I would love you to consider an apology sometime and some full explanation of why you did what you did with my husband, the voicemail said in part, according to NBC News, quote, so give it some thought and certainly pray about this and come to understand why you did what you did, unquote. And I write, incredible, isn't it? Professor Hill called the message inappropriate and reported it to her employer's security department, who in turn reported it to the FBI. Further, Professor Hill said she had no reason to atone, and this was her statement, quote, I have no intention of apologizing because I testify truthfully about my experience, and I stand by that testimony, she said in a statement to NBC News. And then I talk about how... Um, I rode the wave, the Anita Hill wave. It was a rough wave, very high, but I hope you can understand now why Anita Hill, the Anita Hill case translated into victories for women because her story touched the hearts of women and caring men across the nation. Anita Hill is an icon who went through hell for coming forward, and I hope she knows what a difference she made, even though Clarence Thomas got confirmed. So that's another part of my book. So, so that's it. My time is up for yakking at you, and now it's time for you to ask me some questions. So anything you want. It doesn't have to be about the book. It could be about contemporary issues or whatever you want. Feel free. But I know they want you not to make a big speech, so get to the question. <laughs> yes, sir. Good evening, Senator. My name is James Reed. I'm from Redondo Beach, California, working here in D.C. Um, my question concerns um, the voting public on the eve of the California primary. Is it in the public interest as someone who's had a distinguished career in public service to vote for someone who doesn't have previous political experience for offices of president, governor, or U.S. senator? Well, I, I'm trying to, are you talking about Trump? <laughs> I, is that what you're talking about? Well, I could, I could easily say that, or Carly yeah, Fiorina, because it's, Tom Steyer, Al Checky. Oh, it's Tom Steyer in a heartbeat. Yeah. But um, I don't look at, I don't make those kind of broad brush, you know, I, uh, rules. <laughs> I got, the rules of the art are tough, but you got to be open. It could be, you know, the greatest person in the world who chose to be a professor or chose to be in business or chose to champion climate change. Uh, so, uh, no, I don't. I think it's all about who they are, what they propose, what they bring to the table. Um, in the case of Carly Fiorina, she was fired from every job, so she had no, I mean, you know that. <laughs> so she didn't have any, um, anything to bring to the table. Yes. Hi, Senator, my name is Virginia Worley, and I actually work here um, in DC with AFSCME. And I had a question about the recent um, story coming out of Stanford with the sexual assault case um, and them handing down the six-month sentence for the perpetrator, since that's in your home state of California. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your <coughs> opinion on that. Yeah. The issue of uh, sexual assault, whether it's on college campuses or in the military, was brought to my attention by Nicole Boxer, who's a documentary filmmaker who was involved in Invisible War and uh, The Hunting Ground. And those two films just changed my whole sensibility. It's a very painful issue. Um, clearly, we have a very long way to go on this whole issue. And um, I think giving six months to someone who viciously attacked this woman, especially after she was so brave and courageous to come out and explain by the way, he could have gone into jail for 10 years. So to give someone six months, it's outrageous. So it's a constant push. In the United States Senate, Kirsten Gillibrand is leading the way on the military sexual assault. We, yeah, she's phenomenal. And we, we have tried and failed, but to change the culture there. And because right now, when there's a sexual assault against a woman or a man, it goes to the commander. And a lot of times the commander knows the perp or is the perp. So we just, so Kirsten working um, with the, what's the group, military justice, the 
the group that works with her on that. I can't, I can't remember the name. Yeah. Something like protect your defenders. They, we have tried so hard to change that culture, and we have failed, but we are making progress. We had over 50 votes to change it. We want to just keep it in the military, but give it to professional, you know, law enforcement people, not keep it in the, with the commander. So we're making progress. It's very difficult. I think the truth is we have to make this a voting issue, and um, I think we're making progress slowly, but it's too slow. Yeah. Senator Boxer, I'm a college student here in the Washington, D.C. area, and, um, and I'm learning a lot from the art of tough, particularly about the importance of doing one's best to meaningfully contribute to one's community. And what my question is, is would you say that you had any, would you say that you had any especially meaningful and important experiences before serving in the House and Senate that were particularly important in inspiring your oh, that's a good decisions question. and actions in office? Oh, that's such a great question because, yes, it started pretty early because I only got involved in politics because after I had my kids, this goes back so far all the way to the late 60s, early 70s, I recognized that the we were engaged in this never-ending war called the Vietnam War, and it just was impossible to describe to you. Uh, it, was, it was like a rock turned out to be. It was getting us in the middle of a of civil war, killing civilians, and it was brought right into our homes by TV. It was the first war where it was, it was covered in such a way. And I just knew I, w I had gotten an economics degree, but it, I wasn't that interested in advising people on their investments. That was fine, but it was not what I wanted. I wanted to act, become an activist, end the war. So in the local Marin County, we had a, um, we got an initiative on the ballot saying to Nixon, bring the troops home. And we actually won. And at that time, we were more Republicans than Democrats. So that was my first example. Then I also got involved in founding an after-school center so that working parents had a place for their kids. I founded a community TV program. I founded a, a group that helped disadvantaged young women get skills, office skills. I have a whole host of things and uh, eventually got elected to a local board of supervisors where I could do more of those things. So thank you very much. Hi, um, so I had a question that uh, I'd been wanting to ask for a while, but then something very recently came up and I think that it's related. So it's a little bit of a two-part question, but I think it's really a one-part answer. Um, oh God, Okay. just get to it. <laughs> so um, since I've been a little girl, I was never small. So you've had the advantage of having, of being rather petite. So I've always been told that I'm always aggressive and assertive and like, bossy has just been too demure for, to even describe me. So I've always been told to take a step back uh -huh. and not, you know, sit at the table because I scare people. And as a woman that, re and a woman who has a lot of things that she's passionate about, that's super frustrating. So what is something, so basically what is advice you can give to somebody who you know, has been told that their whole life. First of all, you don't look the least bit intimidating to me. <laughs> and whoever thinks that better get a pair of glasses. So I'm serious. Um, <laughs> that is ridiculous on his face. Well, I think um, my best advice is read the book. Read the book. I mean, because you're at Molly Kitty. No, but the book, we do talk about how important that is. And, you know, being petite, I guess maybe it makes you a little bit less, you know, I don't know. But it does, it, look, I've taken it in the chin over and over and over again my whole life. Come on. And uh, it, it, that's why the art of tough is, is critical. And I think the way to do it, frankly, is, again, you, if you feel really strongly, don't dismiss the other person's feelings. Because I have learned in my life, from my family and others, you can't tell someone how to feel. If they feel bad because of something you're doing, you better accept it. You know, you can't tell them. And so I think, don't worry about it. But if somebody says, you know, you're, you're too overpowering, I would get into a conversation and say, well, what makes you say that? Have I hurt your feelings? I, mean, I would engage them because sometimes they really don't mean it. They're just trying to intimidate you, 
trying to get you to back off, get you to leave the room, and not come back. And sometimes they may seriously be hurt by you. So you've got to figure it out. But as far as I'm concerned, don't leave the table. Uh, and don't let anybody intimidate you. And just use these rules that I lay out here, because I think they work. It's really hard to be mad at someone who sings to you or, <laughs> or says something really pretty strong in a verse uh, that rhymes. But my mother, I'll share, I'll share you one thing my mother did say. It's in the book. Um, after that experience, then when I acted out of anger, and I'm trying, I hope I say it exactly the way she said it, because she said, you know, honey, you can tell someone to go to hell, but you can say it in such a nice way that they will thank you for it. <laughs> and that's, that's advice for my, my mother, and that's my advice to you. I also had the second part. That oh, come on. That was no, a lot. Um, we have to give somebody else a chance, truly. Okay. okay. Yes. Hi. Tiptoes here. Um, why don't more progressive Democrats work together to change the, the rules of the game, the system? For instance, we need ballot initiatives to end gerrymandering. I mean, we focus a lot on candidates. And That's a good question. Instead of runoff voting. Well, changing the rules, first of all, the gerrymandering part, that's done by the state legislatures. And where Democrats have failed, and I say this quite honestly, is that we neglected the organizational effort we should have been putting forward in every single state in the union. We just gave up. We didn't do it. And I have a colleague, Byron Dorgan, who retired a while ago in North Dakota, very smart. And he was saying it constantly all through the 90s. We need to get in the states. We need to organize. We're going to lose all these legislatures. We're going to lose governorships. Then they're going to gerrymander the Congress. And that's exactly what they did. And instead of having Nancy Pelosi, we have Paul Ryan, who said all these things about Donald Trump and suddenly decided to endorse him. Um, and I'll tell you, Nancy, I write a lot about Nancy in this book. I love her. And she is so talented and got so much done in that flash of time that she was uh, the speaker. And um, I just think it's, it's awful if you really look at it. When you count up all the votes, Democrats get so many more votes. But we're way behind in the, in the House. But we could, because of the confluence of events, maybe, maybe, this could be a good year. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Thank you so much for coming and speaking. I was wondering, you give a lot of advice. What do you think is the best advice that someone's ever given you when you said it? Oh, the best advice. Oh, that's a wonderful one. I write about it here. My, I had two great mentors in the Senate. One was Barbara Mikulski. One was Ted Kennedy. Okay. Yeah. And um, Barbara, Barbara would, she just knew the way around the place. She knew how you can get on the committees that you really wanted to get on. And she always gave us the courage, like I'm trying to give some of you here tonight, young people, the courage to not be afraid to go for the committees and take your stand and so on and so forth. Teddy, he was the lion of the Senate, and I watched him and I recognized Ted knew how to get things done, get bills passed get executive orders done, get laws done. And he did it by knowing when to talk, when not to talk, who to invite to the organizational meetings, and he shared credit with everybody. He never stepped forward, he shared the credit, and I watched it. And he knew how to cross to the other side, he knew how to find the sweet spot. So I would say, in terms of uh, Perhaps more the personality politics was Barbara, the sense of humor. Who could match her sense of humor? She said, it's not about gender, it's about agenda. <laughs> and she say, it's not about macro politics, it's about macaroni and cheese <laughs> politics. So you could match her, but you learn from her the way to approach things, that sense of humor that was really wonderful. But Ted was amazing. One specific example, nobody really knows that even though Bob Byrd was the voice against the war, it was Teddy who organized the entire thing. And I know because I was his lieutenant, and he said, 
don't say anything to Bob. He said, just call this one, this one, this one, this one. Tell him to show up. Get on the floor at 2 o'clock. You say this, that, 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 that. He orchestrated it like a conductor. And no one knew. And eventually, we turned the tide on the war. It took years and years. Bloody horrible. Yeah. Um, given the setting, I want to say thank you for your chutzpah. That's great. Chutzpah's a good word. Good word. Could use that in your title. But uh, I want to... Um, you know, I thought about it, but I thought that would narrow my audience. <laughs> <laughs> I probably might have loved it. But, uh, but thank you, really, for everything. And um, my question is very pragmatic. I work in the wildlife conservation community. And as a leader, and having a leadership role in that, what is it that we should be doing more, you can make it the broader conservation community, to raise, to be more effective? Because we sure. It's a good answer, good question. And I have an answer that I hope is a good answer. I hope it is. Because I've struggled with the same thing. What I've done is turn to the public health benefits of conservation. Public health benefits, when you get carbon out of the air, there's all these side benefits because you get all that pollution out. And we now know, because the EPA has told us, how many lives are saved from that. We know when you put land in wilderness, you protect it. It's going to be a place for people to breathe some air, find some safe place to go for a swim, and so on and so forth. So I think my tip to the conservation community has been talk about it from the social justice, economic, environmental justice aspect, and public health. Because I really think, when they say, well, environmentalists are elitists, it's just not so. If I could tell you how many times I go home to Los Angeles to the tough barrios, to the areas where they have put all this oil drilling and right in the middle of the city, and I've shut it down. I've shut it down. Not by saying they're putting too much carbon in the air. I shut it down because it's making kids sick. They had nosebleeds. So I think environmentalists ought to understand that. Now, I was told this has to go to eight. It's two minutes to. What do you want to do? You're my boy. We have time for four more questions. Four more questions. All right. So one, two. All right. One, two, three, four. OK. Hi. Um, I'm Jacob. I had the pleasure of uh, being an intern in your uh, office here in DC. I grew up, I grew up in LA. Um, that was back in 02, and I've been in DC ever since on the, the whole, you know, uh, political junkie kind of <laughs> politics thing. But while I've been here, totally uh, as a surprise to me, um, I've really also turned into an advocate as, as a resident of, of DC for all sorts of, of local yeah. issues. And, you know, we have this ridiculous system where people that we don't vote for get to, you know, put, use us as, as you know, kind of pet projects. And, their own values that are a lot of times in disagreement. So yeah, I know there's a lot of people here that work on, on those, those great issues. Um, so what's your of, question? Right, so what, anything, you, you, you know, any, any words of, again, words of wisdom or any, yeah. what's the I'll best? I'll tell you the wisdom. When we had a majority, we had 60 in the Senate, a majority in the House and a Democratic president, we should have fixed that and given DC the right to vote. What a stupid thing, we didn't do it. We, that was the time when I first got there, when you were there. That was the moment. But we just, we took it for granted. Oh, we'll be in charge again, and there's other things to do, and we did Obamacare, we did. I mean, we did the budget under Clinton, that was critical. We should have taken care of business. So it's a lesson learned when you've got the majority. It's like, you know, when you're at the airport, get on the plane that's taken off, because you may be waiting forever. That's a whole other story. But. <laughs> But it's just that you've got to move when you have the votes, when you've got the moment, don't put it off. That's all I can say. So if we do get some majorities, significant majorities, and we have a Democrat in the White House, that's, let's just take care of business and get it done. Who cares what they say? Let's just roll it, get it done. Yeah. Hi, Senator Boxer. Hi. I, uh, my name is Peter. I just got to DC about a week ago. I'm interning for Congresswoman Sherry Bustos. Uh, from Illinois. Great. And speaking of majorities, how do we get a majority of women in the Senate? I know you're talking about yeah. uh, 20 years ago, there were 25 years ago, years ago, there were two of you. How do we get to 50 plus? Yeah. Well, let me tell you the way. It's not magical. Women have to run. And in order to be good, they have to get some experience under their belt. And it's starting to happen. I would suggest that you look at the map this time around for the Senate, 
I don't know that much about the House because I'm focused. I have a PAC and I'm helping the Senate. But there's a lot of fabulous women. Uh, one in Pennsylvania, one against Grassley. Do you know about the one against Grassley? I'll tell you, because it's such a funny story, but I will definitely take the next two questions. But I have to tell you. The leading candidate against Grassley is Patty Judge. That's her name. And her slogan is, finally a judge that Grassley will have to debate. <laughs> I mean, I just love that story. So I think it's as simple as that. We have her, we've got uh, Maggie Hassan running against another woman in New Hampshire. Tammy is phenomenal. Um, Patty is running for re-election. We have a woman running against McCain. Um, we have a great woman running to place Har replace Harry Reid. So it could be another year of the woman. I hope, and I'm working on that. But it's just, it's no magic solution. You just got to get the best. Look, women aren't better than men. I could give you chapter and verse of some examples. Um, one of them saw Russia from her house, that one. Um, you know, they're not, but we are equal. We are equal, and we need to be in the room. Yes. Uh, hi, Karina Slama. Thank you very much. Um, you're um, speaking number seven or something. Come closer, because I can't hear you. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, you're, one of your numbers uh, resonated with me. Uh, it was do the right thing. And yeah. One of the, I'm a public servant, so I work for Homeland Security. I come from New York as well, and 9-11 changed my life. I'm also an immigrant. Well, first generation, I should say. Um, anyways, my question is, I've had the challenge um, for attending over 12 years um, in, like, as a public servant, I'm working for TSA. And I don't understand, my experience has been that when you do stand up to do this right thing, I've actually um, had more women not support me, mm. and had more men support me, and I don't understand fundamentally. You had more men support you than women. Well, that can happen. Barbara Mikulska calls in the Sir Galahads. And I just want to say to the men in this audience, thanks for coming to hear me. It means a lot. I mean, my feeling is, yeah, I mean it. And my feeling is, Real men support women. Those are the real guys. That's how I feel. I almost want to have a button that says that. Because they're not intimidated, they're not afraid, they are secure and caring. And so I wouldn't make the distinction. But again, if you're not being treated fairly by a group of people, my advice is always to be direct and approach because there's a lot of passive aggressiveness that goes on in relationships where people will say things for example, when I was trying to get on committee, um, I was told you got to talk. This was early days in the 80s. I was green. And they said, you've got to try and get on the appropriations committee because California, we have so many needs. So I was working so hard. I went to see everybody. And one of my mentors then was Phil Burton. And he said, Barbara, you go see everybody. You keep a list of you know, what they said. So I did it. I went to all these guys. And they gave me their responses, and Phil said, how's it going? He said, oh, I'm in like Flynn. They were fabulous to me. What did they say? Did you write it down? Yeah, I wrote it down, but they're all for me. Then we go through. The first guy said, you've got my vote. He said, that's great. The next guy said, you're terrific, Barbara. What they can use on that committee is someone like you. And I said, he said, he's not going to vote for you. I said, what do you mean? He said, it's terrific. Barbara, you have to hear the words, you know. So I think it's important not to go see people in a group, but on a one-on-one, -on -one, you go to a cup of coffee and you say, look, you know I've said this because I think it's the right thing. Where do you see that I'm off base here? Can I, in other words, give them that respect. And again, don't be angry about it. Just try to find out. And then if they really hurt you, what I write in the book, Forget about them for the, forever. I didn't talk to Mitch McConnell for 20 years for something he did. And Samantha B said to me, because I did her show, God knows what that's going to be like, but she said to me, she said, you, didn't, you wrote in your book you didn't talk to Mitch McConnell for 20 years. She said, those must have been the happiest years of your life. <laughs> so... Anyway, enough said. I think you, 
You look like you can handle it. Yeah. I think you can handle it. Yes. Hello, Senator Boxer. Um, I'm Marsha. I'm from Sonoma County, California. Oh, great. Uh, it felt very odd not voting for you this year at the election. It's very different. Um, anyway, I want to ask you, when you leave the Senate, what is next for you? Oh, that's a nice question. Um, I have a lot of ideas of what I want to do. So I'll tell you about them in big terms. I can't really even do anything until I'm out. You're not supposed to do anything or make any commitments. But in general, I want to keep helping uh, those who are running for the United States Senate. Because as I explain in this book, the power of one senator is just enormous. They can shut the place down. They can, you know, make sure that legislation is crafted in the way so that it can pass. And so I really feel, although I absolutely detested raising money for myself, I write in the book <laughs> that I would be sitting with a fundraiser and they dial and I would say, oh, I hope they don't answer and I could just talk to the answer machine. You know, the answer machine would come on and say, hi, it's Barbara Boxer, can you come to my event? Thank you very much, bye. You know, because I, asking for money for yourself, it's an awful thing if you've ever had to do it. Um, so that's one thing I want to do. I may want to teach a little bit. I may want to talk show a little bit. I may want to write a column a little bit. I don't know, I have lots of ideas. So, um, but I will say this to all of you who have followed me for years, stay in touch with me at barbaraboxer.com because I'm not gonna go away. I can't, no, I'm, I'm too energetic. <laughs> and um, when somebody said, then why did you leave the Senate? You know, they were mad at me. Well, first of all, I've been there for 40 years. Don't you think I gave it the office? I mean, but, <laughs> um, but why did you leave the Senate? I said, I wanted to leave the Senate while I was still breathing. Because a lot of people just wait a little too long, but I did not want to be in that. And I want to go home as much as DC is exciting. California's in my heart. The, you know, people said, how come you moved there? I said, I was blown away by the beauty of the place. It, you know it, you know it. I'm going up to Santa Rosa to a bookstore in a couple of weeks. Oh, I'll so see you come there. see me there. I'll come see you there. Yeah. <laughs> But anyway, so listen, I just want to say again to all of you, a lot of you bought the book. I'm so grateful because it makes me happy because I think that you will look at government in a little different way. And I don't think it's, it isn't a negative thing. A lot of negative things happen. But what I tried to say is that it's a government of, by, and for the people. And we have to participate because if you don't participate, you're giving it over to people who always participate, the ones that want to pollute the air, the ones that want to, you know, run your private lives, and those folks don't go anywhere. So if you believe that, you know, this is a great nation, and by the way, I have to close with that since I said great. I think of you know who again, but you can't say you want to make America great when you don't know what made America great in the first place. Because what made America great in the first place, and being in this synagogue sure brings it home, is this is a nation of immigrants. We all have come from, so unless you're Native American, you came from somewhere else at some point in your life. <laughs> right, Sawyer? And, 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 we, and we have to love each other. And so the last comment I'll, I'll say, since my son-in-law's here, and he's a fabulous um, fan of sports, I'm a big, um, warrior fan and yeah and I, I want to say it's not a, a late thing that just because they're great for years we watched them lose all the time we went to those games 20 years nothing happened so it's for real but their slogan is strength in numbers what it means is everybody partakes and when you have a leader who wants to turn one person against another and say only certain people can be judges. What is that? You have to have the same background as he has? You have to look like him? There's something so frightening about it, and, and, if, and it will destroy America. So you can't say you want to make America great when you don't understand the diversity, the beauty, everything around us that we have built. We are a very rare nation because of this openness that we have. So I hope that 
when you read this book, although we don't talk about him in the book, the whole message is you don't give up, you stay in there, you fight for what you think is right, and you participate. And the fact that you're here tonight tells me you already know that. But thank you so much for coming out. I'll sign books and take pictures with you. Thank you very much.